Hey, it's good to see you all here this morning. And uh, I want you to take your Bibles, open to the book of Jonah, <clears throat> Jonah chapter 1. We're going to do a new series in Jonah. It's a short little book, but it's got a great message to it, just four chapters. And uh, no doubt you have heard about uh, the story of Jonah, but we want to look at it today. <clears throat> Not long ago, I saw a video of uh, that surfaced about two divers that were almost swallowed by a, a whale, a humpback whale, in uh, Southern California. The whole, whole incident was caught on tape, and the divers missed uh, being swallowed by just a few feet, so the whale missed. But I want to talk to you about a story of a whale who didn't miss. Uh, he was able to get his guy <laughs> here in this story. And uh, so let's look, about, look at the story of Jonah. Look at Jonah chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him, and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Now, Let's, a few things about Jonah. We're going to look at the first part of Jonah chapter 1, the verses 1 to 17 here today, Lord willing. And this first part is the story of Jonah running from the Lord, running from God. We're going to hopefully show that it's not a good idea to try to run from the Lord, all right? Wherever you end up, the Lord will already be there waiting for you. Whatever assignment he gave you, it's still, he'll give it to you again. If, if he's gracious, like he was with Jonah. But several things as we think about this, uh, Jonah was a prophet of Israel. Uh, number one, he was a real man. The reason I emphasize this is because many scholars and critics doubt the literalness of this story. <clears throat> they say it's impossible for a man to be swallowed by a whale. And so many critics laugh at this story. Uh, they read this uh, experience of Jonah, and they say, well, there's no way that that could have happened. So some, therefore, liberal religious scholars and theologians develop this pious theory that the story of Jonah was really just an allegory or a parable. It couldn't be something that was literal. Um, what, what Jonah went through, somehow this all symbolizes the nation of Israel and God's working with the nation of Israel. Um, but several things about that, um, you know, Jonah, we, we see Jonah, this literal man in the book of Kings. Uh, there's, a, there's a passage in the book of Kings about him where he was a prophet to the northern uh, part of Israel where he made a prophecy about uh, the, uh, the abundance of Israel, how God's going to restore the boundaries of Israel. And of course, that prophecy did come true. And so um, this uh, happened around the reign of King Jeroboam II, about the 8th century. And uh, at this period in the history of Israel, it's significant um, with reference to the kingdoms that were around it. The enemy empires of Egypt and Assyria were experiencing crisis. And so um, with this happening, um, this temporary freedom, Israel was able to experience times of prosperity. And so during that time, um, uh, Jonah spoke this prophecy about the boundaries of Israel being restored. And so, um, and so all this happened. Um, you know, all of this happened. Now, God calls Jonah, as we know, to go to a place called Nineveh. Again, all these things are, are, are historical places, historical people. Um, you know, just to look at the map, you know, if you look down there in this red section, that's Israel, the green section is the empire of Assyria. Basically, God was calling Jonah away from Israel, being a prophet of Israel, and now God was calling him to go outside the nation of Israel and to be a prophet to the Assyrians. 
And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but that wasn't a, a pleasant prospect for Jonah. It would be like the Lord asking me to leave here this friendly, wonderful congregation of grace, Jerry, and go be a missionary to ISIS. You mean those people that are cutting off everybody's head? Or, or some area where there was, there was hostility, where there were enemies. That's what the Assyrians were like. They were very cruel. However, we're, we're getting back to this idea that this is a literal story. Um, Jonah is a real prophet who lived at a historical time in Israel. God called him to go to a, a, a place called Assyria, Nineveh specifically. Just five reasons to take this book as genuine history. Number one is, Jonah, as we saw, was a real historical figure. The Bible makes that clear in 2 Kings. Also, another thing is, Jonah is a collection of 12 minor prophets. So think about that. The placing of this in the collection of the minor prophets, is in, the, the compiler is implying then that Jonah was a historical figure, just like all the other prophets in Israel were literal historical people. Even so, Jonah was also a literal historical figure person. Uh, Thirdly, the miracles in Jonah are not impossible for the God of the Bible. You just have to believe that God does miracles, right? Lee Scarborough was preaching on the story of Jonah being swallowed by a whale, and later his son came to him and said, Dad, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? And he said, well, son, if 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 you believe that God created the world out of nothing, it's not hard for God to allow a whale to swallow a man. And, uh, and, then, and then spit him out on shore. And his son said, well, Dad, if you're going to bring God into the picture, that's different. You know, you just have to bring God into the picture. God is able to do these things. Now, this is assuming that this was a miracle. I don't know if you've read, I'm doing some research on this. Um, there was a story that took place back in the early uh, or late 19th century, early 20th century, of a man who was swallowed by a whale. I don't know if you ever read that story, the story of James Bartley. He was a, a whaler back when they had whaling ships, uh, and um, he was on board a, 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 a boat called the Star of the East, and they were doing a whaling expedition off the Falkland Islands, and supposedly his boat that he was in, the little rowboat where they went out to dispatch, was attacked by a whale, and uh, he was thrown overboard, and, and they never found him until they killed the whale, they were dis- detaching the stomach of the whale, put it on dock, and they cut open the stomach, and there was the, the lost sailor. Um, and according to the story, the story goes that, you know, he was uh, in shock, obviously. Um, they revived him. Um, they said the rest of his life, you know, his, his skin was bleached. He was blind because of that, what he, what he had gone through there, the acid from the whale's uh, stomach and so on. And on his tombstone, it is written, uh, a modern-day Jonah. That's when he died, they put on his tombstone, a modern-day Jonah. Now, that story has been circulated in many magazines and journals. Uh, investigations into the story, some say, well, we doubt whether this is authentic, whether this could really happen, and there's debate about whether that was real or not. But even if it's not real, we still don't have to doubt the story in the Bible of Jonah. Um, the main thing I would give you is this. Jesus spoke of Jonah as being in the fish and preaching in Nineveh as real events. So really the issue here is this. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus is telling a a fish tale? (laughs) Uh, Or do you believe that Jesus is telling the truth? Of course we believe Jesus is telling the truth. If he's not telling the truth about this story, he's telling an untruth. If he's telling an untruth, that's not right. Of course, he's the Savior of the world. I have a big problem with someone that would doubt the story of Jonah because you call in question then the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus refers to this story in the New Testament as something that, was, that happened, that was real. And uh, now there are some people that believe that Jonah actually died when he went into the, uh, to, into the sea and God revived him because when Jesus compares this story of Jonah, he compares it to his own resurrection. Just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And we know Jesus literally died on the cross and was resurrection. So there are some that say, well, this was a miracle of God. Jonah literally died and God revived him. And, that, and that's some take that to be the truth in it. 
Nevertheless, that's some of the debate about it, but we take this as a literal story. The last thing is, I would say, the historical difficulties of Jonah can largely be resolved. Uh, that's, that's not a problem for us to resolve a lot of these things. And so um, he was a real person, is what I want you to see. And uh, secondly, I want you to see that he was, he was a reluctant missionary. Um, God had called him to a certain ministry, and he was reluctant to obey that call. Now, before you criticize Jonah, you have to examine your own life and ask yourself this, have I been reluctant in my own life to obey a clear command that God has given me as a Christian? You know, we're, we can be pretty harsh on Jonah, but we have to examine our own life. Are we doing what the Lord has called us to do, what the Lord has commanded us to do? Uh, Jonah represents to me the believer who's reluctant to obey God or God's call to them. And Jonah, he didn't feel comfortable being a witness to a group of people uh, under the Assyrian Empire, to the, to the Ninevites. Uh, he just, that was out of his comfort zone. Uh, he didn't want to go there. The overall theme of the book of Jonah is God's compassion to the lost. God wants to reach out to the Gentiles. God is calling Jonah, a Jewish prophet, to be a witness to the Gentile people. And again, Jonah, he didn't feel comfortable doing that. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to reach out. By the way, did you know God has called all of us to be a witness to everyone around us? You say, well, I don't, I don't feel comfortable talking to people. Probably the same way Jonah felt. He probably was really comfortable in Israel. In fact, he was at that time riding a wave of popularity because he just made a popular prophecy that came true. It was for the good of Israel. So I imagine at this point in Jonah's life, he was, you know, enjoying where he was. He was enjoying the fact that he was a well-received prophet in Israel. And now here's God saying, I want you to leave Israel. I want you to go to Nineveh. And we go, where, God? The place where they're killing us? Our enemies? And so he was a reluctant missionary. He did not want to go, even though God made it very clear to go. In fact, the book opens up where God says, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great uh, city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, one of the things God said was, you know, I'm going to judge this, this nation. If, if they don't turn to me, you, you cry against it. But whenever God sends a preacher or a missionary to preach, what does that imply? That God's given you a what? Another opportunity. You better turn. You better repent or judgment is going to come. And Jonah knew this in his heart. In fact, later on at the end of the book, when Jonah is unhappy, he's sitting on the side of the hill and he's mad because God brought revival and Jonah was waiting for God to judge him. And one of the things Jonah told God was, this is the reason I didn't want to come. I didn't want to come because I knew you were going to do something to save these people. Isn't that, isn't that something? What kind of testimony is that from a preacher? I didn't want to go preach this revival because I knew you'd bring revival. And I didn't want there to be revival. I knew you were going to bring salvation. I didn't want that to happen. Jonah had such a hostility and a hatred toward the enemies of Israel that he didn't want to see them get saved. What a, what a testimony that is. So he was a reluctant missionary. We could also say he was a rebellious minister. Instead of obeying the call that God gave him, he decided to do something else. He purposely did the opposite. Instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah decided to go west to Joppa. That wasn't very smart. You know, sometimes we do stupid things. You know that? Sin can make us stupid. Jonah actually thought that he could run from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Somehow, his theology wasn't complete. Somehow, he, didn't, he missed the class in systematic theology that taught the principle of the omnipresence of God. He missed that class. Because Jonah thought in his mind that if he went far enough away, if he went far enough um, west, that he could escape the presence of God. So he got on a ship and he went to Tarshish. This, at this time in the history of humanity, this would, be a, this would be, you would say, literally to the ends of the earth at that point. He went all the way to 
Tarshish. And what was he doing? He was running from the Lord. He was a man on the run. But he thought he could get out of God's presence. Um, and sometimes we might not think that we can get out of God's presence, but we do often. Oh, I say often. I don't know about that. But sometimes we run from what God wants us to do. We're running from the Lord. David faced difficult decisions. and He was tempted to flee. He wrote this, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly and be at rest. Lo, then I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. David said, man, I wish I had wings like a dove because I would get out of here. You ever feel that way? Man, I wish I could just get away from all this, get away from all the stress, all the difficulty. By the way, do you know Jonah's name? actually means in the Hebrew dove. He is fleeing like a bird. And uh, one wonders if Jonah thought about these words of David when he, when he ran from the Lord. And so uh, he tries to run from the Lord. Now, we just want to talk to you about the cause of his running, because now he's running from the Lord. Um, and Jonah's story really illustrates what happens to us when we try to run from God's call or God's will or the responsibilities that God has placed upon us as Christians or whatever responsibility we have in our particular calling. And so basically, Jonah had some wrong attitudes that caused him to run. What were were they? Well, first of all, he had a wrong attitude towards the will of God. He thought that God's will wasn't best for him. He's like many Christians today. He thought he knew better than God. God, this is not good for me. When God's will and his will came into conflict, Jonah thought, I think I know better here. You heard about the man who broke down in a Model T Ford right after they were uh, invented. The man in the, uh, uh, this man broke down. He was alongside of the road. A beautiful white car came up right behind him. A man got out in a nice suit and said, can I help you with this? And uh, the man looked at him and he said, you don't look like you work on cars. I don't need your help. And so the man said, very well. He got back in his car and drove off. Someone who saw that said, you know who that was? That was Henry Ford. He built these things. He knows what it takes to make them run. You know what? God made you. The next time you're tempted to think that you know better than God, just remember that God created you. He made you. He knows what, it's, he, knows what he made, created you for, what he created you to do. And you should just submit to his will because it's better than your will. You know, again, at this time in the history of Israel, I think in Jonah's mind, he wanted to be the next great prophet of Israel because at this time in the history of Israel, Elijah and Elisha were gone. They had passed off the scene. There was a need for a prophet in Israel, as I said. Uh, He had made a prophecy and was kind of riding a wave of popularity. And this idea of just going to, leaving Israel, his uh, his home people, his own nationality, and to go to minister to some vicious Gentiles. That was just not what he thought he should be doing. But you know what? This was God's will. And friend, God's will is always best for you, and it's always best for me. So he had a bad attitude about the will of God. And I would also say he had a bad attitude about witnessing. Jonah had this this attitude that you know, you turn witnessing on and you turn it off. You know, uh, it's almost like a hat that you wear. Now I got to put on my witnessing hat. Now I got to go out and witness. Sometimes I'm afraid that we communicate that message wrongly in the church. You know, like we have a Tuesday night outreach, and it's a, it's almost like you know, I, now I got to put on my outreach hat. Now I got to come up and I got to go to outreach at church, and I got to be a witness. And 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 then after Tuesday night's over with, I can take that hat off, and I don't have to worry about witnessing anymore. And that's not really the way it is. If you're a believer, you are a witness whether you realize it or not. You're a witness everywhere you go, every day of your life. And the truth is, you're either a good witness or you're a bad witness. But you are a witness. You can't just turn it on and turn it off. Ezekiel said it like this, you're a watchman on the wall. You're to warn the wicked of their wickedness. And if you don't warn the wicked of their wickedness, their blood will I require at your hands, God said. It's a very strong passage in the Old Testament. God says one day you'll have bloody hands if you're not warning others of their plight, warning them of their 
error of their way, if you're not witnessing and being a watchman, then God says, one day I will require it at your hands. So we're responsible as Christians to be that witness. I was reading a, a, a book of George, by George Sweeting called The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing, and he tells of a man by the name of John uh, Curie, who in 1949 was found guilty of a, a serious crime, and he was sentenced to many years in prison. And while he was in prison, he had his, um, his term, basically, his sentence was terminated, and a letter was sent bearing the good news that he was now a free man. But John never got that letter. And years and years went by, and that message, that letter, was never delivered to John until one day a sheriff uh, officer found this and finally went to him and delivered him the message, but it was many years later. And then Sweeting concluded this story in his book by saying, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important in your life, And year after year, the urgent message was never received. Think about that. The most important message for the world today is that even though they're under condemnation, God offers them freedom through Christ, forgiveness of their sin, freedom from the guilt of their sin, eternal life. And you know what? The truth of the matter is many people just don't know that, and they haven't been given that message. And so Jonah had his wrong attitude about, being a witness for God. But then I would say this, he had a bad attitude about his enemies. Um, Again, he didn't want to see these people of Nineveh get saved. Now, if you've been a Jew living in the ninth century, um, you wouldn't even want to visit the city of Nineveh. You wouldn't even want to go there. That was a dangerous place. It was inhabited by godless, wicked, violent people, the Assyrians, Archaeological inscriptions have been found in which Assyrian kings, on those inscriptions, they boast of their own cruelty, such as flaying their enemies, flaying their skin, hanging their skin on the city walls. Um, in fact, in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 8, look at, look at that verse real quick, um, the end of it, Ch- Jonah chapter 3, verse 8, but let men and beasts be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their, what? In their hands. Um, this might be a reference to the fact that um, the Assyrian soldiers, whenever they conquered people, would cut off people's head. And they would walk around holding the heads of their enemies in their hands. Uh, again, you know, there is... Um, there's inscriptions about this. Um, you know, he basically, this king, Asher, Naser, Paul, um, the second, there's a famous palace relief which depicts some of his campaigns, and his descriptions are gory. They're based on cruelty. He describes cutting off the hands, feet, noses, ears, and lips of his prisoners. And so, again, this was a very, very evil king. W- wicked things were done. And um, again, these inscriptions show this, and I don't have time to go through all of that, but um, a little bit here about the cruelty of the Assyrians. Um, They were very ruthless. They were very cruel. You can see these guys are in this inscription here. I don't know if you can see it well, but they're impaled on a a stake there. Um, In fact, some people believe that it was out of Assyria and the Assyrians came the whole invention of crucifixion, and the Romans kind of perfected it. But you can see here in this inscription where they have them impaled on, their enemies are impaled on these stakes. And so they were just very, very cruel people here. And so this is why Jonah is running. He's running because he just doesn't want to go there. He has no burden for these folks. He has no compassion on them. But you have to remember that, you know, God called Israel to be a light to all the nations around them. In fact, at the very beginning, when God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees to follow him, what did God say? I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. Israel was, when they made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai, God said, you're going to be my glory through the rest of the world. You're going to be a light unto the rest of the people. You're going to be a a nation of priests. 
And what does a priest do? A priest speaks to God on behalf of the people and the people on behalf of God. You're going to go out. You're going to be my witnesses to all the world. That was the call of Israel. And the book of Jonah shows this missionary emphasis, the fact that God is sending out a prophet to a dark place, to a cruel people, people that need the gospel, that need the Lord. That's, that was their call. By the way, did, did you know that's why God has us here in Baltimore? Baltimore needs the gospel, beloved. They need for us to go out. Brother Ron Moon, you know, hope you don't mind me sharing this story. Brother Ron was telling me just before Sunday school today, Brother, Brother Ron goes down and works in the inner city with Tom Homans at the Christian um, Community Center down there. And just last week, he was going down there to do what he normally does. He got out of his car. A guy came up to him and asked him for 35 cents. And, and, and Ron was very generous. Ron gave him $2. But then the guy pulled out a gun and said, I want your wallet, your car keys. Um, and, and pulled a gun on Ron. Now, if it were me, I would say, here's the keys, it takes unleaded, you know. But, but now Ron didn't. <laughs> I'm a coward, though, but Ron's not. But He said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm glad you're here this morning, Brother Ron, <laughs> by the grace of God. And, you know, the Lord watched over and protected him. But later on, this same guy went around and he robbed somebody else. And so it's a very dangerous place. But you know what? I'm glad that we have people that are out there sharing the gospel. And uh, because that's what we're called to do. We're called to carry the gospel to places where they need the gospel. Uh, And so Israel was to be this light to the rest of the world. And God was calling Jonah to go and, and be that light. Now, Jonah, he was... Uh, he was a man who just didn't have a burden for the lost. He, he lacked God's heart for lost people. In fact, this is what the whole book of Jonah is about. You know what it's about? It's about God's grace and compassion for those who do not know him. We kind of see this all the way at the end of the book. Look in, Jonah, look in chapter 4, look at verse number 2, where it says this. And, uh, and verse 1, And it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry, and he prayed in the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was it this not my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. In other words, um, again, this is Jonah saying, this is the reason why I didn't want to come because I knew that you were compassion, a compassionate God. I knew that you would have compassion on this city. And then um, we also see this same thing. Um, look down in chapter 4, look down in verse number 11. And, sh- and this is God speaking. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than threescore thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left? In other words, again, here's God expressing, shouldn't I have compassion? And so um, this is what the whole book is about, God's compassion and love for those that don't know him, for even the ungodly. And and that's why we're here, to share the gospel to those who don't know him. Now, let's talk about, secondly, we saw the cause of his running. Jonah had some wrong attitudes. Let's think about the course of his running, because at first when Jonah runs from the Lord, everything seems good. Uh, He goes, you know, everything seems to be working out. By the way, when you disobey the Lord sometimes, everything at first might seem like it's going fine. And you can even justify and reason in your mind, oh, God must be with me in this. Certainly seemed that way here for Jonah. The circumstances seemed to be right here. Everything seemed to want. When Jonah went to the dock, um, in verse number 3, he found a ship going to Tarshish. Uh, There was a ship waiting there to take him to Tarshish. The timing on everything seemed right. Right when Jonah got to the Joppa, there happened to be a ship right there at that time going to Tarshish. Wow, what a remarkable coincidence. I think Jonah's thinking, okay, all right, everything's going good now. That's often the case when we start running from the Lord. Things at first seem to go right. He was offered safe passage um, by the people. He pays the fare in verse number 3. So he paid the fare thereof. And so... um, and so, you know, everything's going well. Now, what's interesting to me is that, um, you know, the nation of Israel was not really a seafaring nation 
Other nations passed through Israel on profitable trade routes to travel both east and west. Jonah, therefore, would have to board a ship, a Phoenician ship, at a port, which at this time would be in a Philistine territory. And remember, the Philistines were also the enemies of God. So there would be some risk here in Jonah going where he went. Um, There was still some hostility. What's interesting to me is that Jonah is not willing to risk his life to obey God, but he is willing to risk his life to disobey God. He's willing to go to enemy territory to get a ship to run from God. He's not just not willing to go to enemy territory to share the gospel. But Jonah finds some sailors. These are friendly sailors. I think they're probably happy to have him on board. And uh, he has the money, as we saw. Um, and by the way, let's look, think about Tarshish. Where is Tarshish? We don't really know exactly um, where it is. There's some, there's some speculation about where Tarshish would have been. Um, the, uh, some clues from the biblical references also kind of help us where it could be. It was a place west of Israel in the Mediterranean, um, an ancient Phoenician colony perhaps. Um, some believe it could it be Spain. You know, recently I read an article, actually I think it was my daughter Abby that sent me this article, she lives over there in London, where a lot of people believe that, that Tarshish was England, it was, uh, it was actually uh, Cornwall, uh, because they found some, uh, you know, with science today, they're able to look at metals that they find in Israel and actually find where that metal originated. And they found that some of the metals that they found in ancient Israel, all the way back in the 8th century B.C., they, they traced it to Cornwall, England, if you can imagine that. And, of course, in Cornwall, England, they're known for their, their mines, their tin mines. So some people trace Tarshish to be perhaps that area of England. Some think it's Spain. Um, and so some people think it's located in Africa somewhere, perhaps in the Red Sea. Um, we're really not sure specifically where Tarshish is, but we, knew, we do know this. This was probably the farthest place at that point that Jonah could think of when he was running away from the Lord. So, so far, every so good. The circumstances seem right. He was offered safe passage on the ship. Uh, he had money to pay the fare. He was at peace. You say, how do we know that? Because in verse number five, he, we find him asleep in the, in the bottom of the ship. So, I mean, He's, everything seems to be going well here. But there's, there's a literary device, I think, that we see here in chapter 1. It's where it says, he went down. You, you notice that? He went down. We see this word used four times. Twice in verse number 3, look at this. But Jonah arose to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and he went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare of them. He went down into it to go to them unto Tarshish. And then in verse number five, Jonah went down into the ship where he was where he was gone down. It says in verse number five, where he lay down. And later on, he's going to go down into the sea. You say, what's the idea here? It's almost like the writer is trying to tell us that. When you run from the Lord, you're just you're headed downward. You're going down. That's the direction. You always go down. You might think that by doing the will of God is dangerous, but to not do the will of God is even more dangerous. And Jonah was going down. The real danger for Jonah here now is that he is out of the will of God. And so uh, look, notice the consequences of his running. God put him in a storm. So look at verse number 4. And the Lord sent out a great wind. God's about to teach Jonah some lessons. And of course, the first one is you can't run from God. If you do, you might end up in a storm. I love the theology of the book of Jonah. The main character in the book of Jonah is not Jonah, and it's not the whale either. The main character of the book is God. God's the main character. And the main lesson, as I said, is his compassion on the lost. But there are other um, sub-themes that we see throughout the book, and one of those is the sovereignty of God, and which is to say that God is in control of everything, right? His hand is in control of everything. And so we see this in verse number 4 where it says, 
the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. This wasn't just an accidental storm that came. This is the Lord who did this. We see his sovereign hand in all this. The lot will fall upon Jonah in verse number 7. That's not an accident. And then the immediate calming of the storm in verse number 15 when they threw Jonah overboard, that's not an accident. And do you think that it was an accident that that whale happened to be in that particular spot at that time? None of those things are accidents. God sent the winds. God sent the whale. God is in complete control of everything that's going on here. And so it's the Lord that hurls out this storm and, and by the way, this storm, as we're going to see, was not just any normal storm, because look again in verse 4, the Lord sounded that a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried, every man to his God. So this was a storm that was the, the we could say, the storm of storms, the king of all storms, because these mariners who were accustomed to, you know, being in storms, I'm sure, out there on the Mediterranean. Uh, they had never seen anything like this. They had been in storms before, but nothing of this magnitude had ever hit them. And so as a result, they begin to, to cry out unto their gods, the Bible says here in, in verse number 5. And so... There may be times in your life and in my life when God will throw out a storm on us. We see this in the Scripture often. God will send storms. There are storms of correction, and there are storms of perfection. Sometimes you're in a storm because God's correcting you, because you have not obeyed Him. You haven't done what He's asked you to do. And so, therefore, God might take you through a storm, just like we see here in the book of Jonah. Then sometimes there are storms of perfection. It's not that you've done anything wrong. It's just that God's trying to teach you to mature in your faith, to learn to trust him. And so God, like we see this in the New Testament with the disciples of Jesus, when they went through storms, sometimes they were doing exactly what the Lord asked them to do. But they're in the middle of a storm, and that storm was not for correction. That was per for perfection. God was teaching them and perfecting their faith, maturing their faith. This is obviously here a storm of correction. God hurls this storm where it says the, the verb sent. It's used elsewhere in the Old Testament to talk about throwing an object. It's the same word used when, when uh, Saul threw a spear at David. Same verb here. God throws this storm at Jonah, and it's such a violent storm that the ship is, is, is going to break apart. And the sailors, again, these experts, were so afraid. They recognized this is not a normal storm, and now they're in danger. I want you to think about this. God has called us as believers to be a blessing. Remember, God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you that you might bless others. When we're doing the will of God and we're obeying the Lord, we become a blessing to others around us. But when we disobey God and we're not doing the will of God, we can endanger people around us. This is exactly what's happening here with Jonah. Jonah, God's prophet, is in a dangerous situation, and these sailors are in that same boat. They're now in a dangerous situation. Jonah was supposed to be a blessing, but here he's being a danger. In fact, he's not concerned about it because in verse number 5 it says, uh, but Jonah was going down into the sides of the ship. He, le he lay and was fast asleep. Um, it's, you, know, you can't help but notice the contrast between the sailors and Jonah. They're working frantically. Jonah's sleeping. He's gone below deck, literally into the innermost. He's, he's not worried about anything. Um, and it makes me wonder, how could he be asleep in a storm of this magnitude? You know, he's in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, and he's not praying. We could say this about this. Jonah lost his desire for prayer, you know, when you're not where you, want to, you should be and you're not in the will of God, you're, not, you're going to lose your appetite to pray. And notice this verse number 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, o sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that the Lord will think upon us that we perish not. And so he rebukes Jonah. 
Um, often the world has a right to rebuke the church and the people of God for their apathy. And this is one case here where this guy's right. He rebukes Jonah. What are you doing? You're here. You don't care. You don't understand the danger that we're in. You should be praying. Here's an unbeliever rebuking Jonah rightly. And so he loses his testimony, really, Jonah does, because in verse number 7, and they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell upon Jonah. Now, again, this was not an accident. Casting lots was something they did in the ancient Near East where they would throw stones on the ground. They find out that this is, this is the, the reason for this is Jonah. They knew that he was the cause of the problem. Uh, and so what did they do? <clears throat> Look in verse number 8. Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thy occupation, and whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which is made to see in the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, What hast thou done? Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What, what shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And look at verse 12. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I, I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleases thee. And so the lot falls upon Jonah. Now here they realize he's running from his God, and they understand that God is angry at Jonah, and so he loses his testimony. He says, you know, I worship God. He wasn't doing a very good job worshiping God because when you're disobedient and running from the Lord, you're really not worshiping. So he kind of loses his testimony with these people, and he almost loses his life because finally in desperation, they're rowing, they're trying to get out of this. It's not working. So you know what they do? In verse 15, look at this very closely in key verse here. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. This is an incredible thing here. Finally, in desperation, they lift Jonah up. Now, the word for lift up here is an interesting Hebrew verb. It's the verb nasa, which means you lift up as in a sacrifice. Did you know that in the Old Testament, when a, before a priest would, would, would uh, take the animal and cut its throat and put it on the altar. The priest would take and lift the animal up to God. That was the first thing he would do, nasa, same verb. He would lift up the sacrifice, then he would put it down and then sacrifice the animal. This is the same verb here. And the idea, what the priest was saying when he lifted up the animal was, God, let all the guilt be on this animal. Let all the, this animal is now bearing the sin and the guilt and here it is, let your wrath fall upon this animal. And there's a sense in which this is what the mariners are doing. They're lifting up Jonah to God, and they say, God, here's the source of the problem right here. And guess what? We're getting rid of him. And they throw him overboard. And the Bible says immediately that the sea ceases from its raging. This is an incredible thing here. And by the way, in this part of the story, Jonah becomes a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, how can a rebellious prophet be a, a type of Christ? Well, Jesus himself used Jonah and compared his ministry to Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. In the sense that Jesus would be the one lifted up at Calvary, and he would bear the wrath of God at Calvary. All of God's wrath fell on Jesus, and Jesus was cast into a sea of God's wrath because of our sin. And then, of course, later he would rise again from the dead. But even Jesus in the New Testament um, will make this comparison. But again, verse 15, the word lift up here, very important word, and um, let your guilt come upon Jonah, they were saying. And, uh, and so this is the part of the story, again, where Jesus uh, uses this to 
where it really speaks of Jesus typically, and Jesus will later compare himself to Jonah um, when he says, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights. So, and, and this is in Matthew chapter 12, um, where the, remember the Pharisees come and they ask Jesus for a sign, and Jesus says, you know, the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days and three nights. And, uh, and, then he'll, and then Jesus will use this as an opportunity to condemn that generation because Jesus says, you know, the, the Ninevites repented at the preaching of Jonah. A greater than Jonah is here, and you haven't repented at my preaching. Think about that. Who's a greater prophet, Jesus or Jonah? Jesus, of course. Jesus, Jonah was disobedient and ran from God. Jesus was obedient and was zealously committed to doing the Father's will. Jonah went, wept outside Nineveh because the people repented. Jesus wept outside of Jerusalem because the people did not repent. Jonah did not have a love for his enemies. Jesus demonstrated his love for his enemies continually. Jonah performed no miracle. Jesus performed miracles constantly to authenticate his ministry. Jonah was just a prophet. Jesus was the Son of God. Jonah preached a part of the truth. Jesus was the whole revealed truth of God. Jonah preached to only one city, Jesus preached to hundreds of cities. Jonah was thrown into the storm of God's wrath. Jesus willingly entered into the storm of God's wrath for us. One of the greatest revivals in history took place in Nineveh as a result of Jonah's preaching. One of the greatest rejections in history took place as a result of Jesus' preaching. The people didn't receive him, many of them wholesale. And so that's why Jesus condemned that generation there. Um, And again, when Jonah was cast into the sea, immediately the sea ceased from its raging. And the sailors saw this as something that God did. They began to offer sacrifices to God. They stopped worshiping pagan gods and began to worship the true God, the God of Israel. The Midrash, which is a Jewish commentary on the Old Testament, understands this to mean that they threw their idols into the waves and returned to Joppa and went up to Jerusalem and became proselytes. But... um, In verse 17, I need to wrap this up in just a minute here. Look at verse 17. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So the word prepare, appointed, ordained. God appointed this fish. Now, the word for fish, the the, the Hebrew word, um, let me just get to that, is, is dagadol, literally means great fish. And the Hebrews didn't have a word for whale, So they use the word dag to refer to both whales and fish. So there's that big debate. You know, was it a big fish? Was it a whale? You know, um, the whale is a symbol of the mercy and grace of God. A lot of times people think of this story and they think of of the whale as a judgment. But the whale is not a judgment. The whale is a symbol of God's what? Compassion. Because if the whale wasn't there, what would have happened to Jonah? He would have died. The whale that swallowed Jonah up was God's compassion. It was also God giving Jonah a second chance because this whale is going to take Jonah to the shore, spit him out, and the word of the Lord is going to come to Jonah again. And this time, Jonah is going to run to Nineveh. You know, so Jonah gets a free submarine ride instead of a, whale, a, a boat trip. And it saves him, it saves his life. So, you know, you hear hear, hear that slogan, you know, save the whales. Yeah, save the whales. This whale here is obedient to God. He's God's servant. So, again, the whale is all about God's compassion, and that's what the whole book of Jonah is about. It's having compassion on people. That's all we have time for. We're going to look at chapter 2 next week. Let's, Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for this beautiful story of your love and compassion and how you love all people and want people to come to know you. And Lord, you've called us to be your messengers, your servants, to take the good news of your grace and your mercy to others. May we be obedient. May we learn from Jonah that we have this responsibility and we can't escape it. So help us be obedient servants of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.